The following Stealing the Mind Bible Conference presentation is by Frank Peretti and is entitled, A Few Things I Learned Since I Knew It All. For a free catalog of all of our tapes and books, call Compass at 1-800-977-2177 or on the web at compass.org. But let's pray first. I just want to... Woo, you know, thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your faithfulness to us, your long suffering for the fact that you're, boy, what a dad you are. How you raise us and you grow us and you strengthen us. And I pray, Lord, tonight that your Holy Spirit would take the words that you give me to say and just plant them as precious seeds in all these hearts right where they need to be planted, that the needs of each individual soul would be met in their own special way tonight. Uh, help me to edit on my feet and give me the words to say for these dear folks. And I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I have entitled this talk, A Few Things I Learned Since I Knew It All. Yeah, there's one interesting thing. Let me just tell you about kids. Now, you know about kids. Most all of us know about kids. We've either raised kids or we've been kids. And kids have rules for life. We all have rules for life. I don't know who, where we ever got them. We just make them up just automatically, you know? Uh, rules that kind of say things like, I should always be able to have my dessert first. And rules that kind of say, I shouldn't really have to clean up my room if I don't want to. And rules that basically say, I shouldn't have to share with anybody. Rules that say, you know, if I bribe mom and dad, maybe they'll give me. I had my own little rule. This isn't unique to me, but boy, I was just really into Superman and Peter Pan. Because they could both do the same thing. They could fly. And, and Peter Pan had the answer, you know. If you just believe, you can fly. I believed and I believed. I never really could fly. I'd hit the ground pretty quick. But, you know, when, when you're a kid, you live in this fantasy world where you just want things to be just so nice and so easy and just be able to do what you want to do. And, and, and you know, you, you grow up a little more and you skin your knees and you bump your shins and you put up with a few hard knocks and mom and dad try to get you through it. And, and after a while, you grow up. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you? <laughs> well, I'm going to reflect on that. I, here's where my, my big story begins. If you wanted to write this out as a screenplay or you're watching a movie or something. Here I am this, uh, a couple years ago. I was sitting across the table. We were having a, a lunch after a, a, a morning service. I was speaking at a church. And, and there was this young uh, college group that were at the table there, and they wanted to have lunch with Frank Peretti. So, sure, that's fine. So we had lunch, and we were talking about uh, some of the big spiritual movements that were going on during that time. The body of Christ has a lot of movements. <laughs> you can take it that way if you want. It's all right. Yeah, we have movements, all right. And uh, this one particular movement involved uh, laughing and barking. And um, some of you might remember it. I won't uh, go into detail about it. But it was one of those things that was supposedly very, very spiritual. It was really a move of God. And, and we were kind of, you know, well, there's, there's this qualification. There's that qualification. There's this caution. We have to be careful. And, uh, and I, was talk, I was sitting across the table from this young college gal. She was, I think, just a freshman, just going into college. And she was all, oh, hallelujah. She was just really pumped and revival. And I uh, said, well, you know, what you, you need to be, uh, Jill, you need to be wise, and you don't want to just uh, dive into any old thing. And she says, are you ready? She says, I want everything God has for me. You want everything God has for you. <laughs> Young lady. You don't know what you're saying, you know. <laughs> she was, what, 18, 19 years old? And I was looking at her, and I said to myself, man, 
I was right where she is now, 30 years ago. And if this was a movie, you can just see the camera start to, you know, the wavy screen, like we're going back in time. Yeah, I can remember how it was for me. Oh, you grow up in, at home and you're a little kid, and you know what's interesting is your mom and dad raise you and try to put a little bit of wisdom into you, and supposedly by the time you leave home, I'm grown up. And then you realize you're not grown up and you still have a parent. The Lord God himself, your mom and dad may not be around, but the Lord God is. And he's going to make sure you keep growing up. And oh, sometimes we still want to act like kids. Well, I, way back then, I remember some of the interesting adventures that would happen in church and things like that. I remember when uh, we still had kind of a, a Peter Pan Magical view of Christianity. You've probably seen that. If I just believe, if I say the right things, if I get my magic fairy dust or whatever our little form of it might be, I can get what I want. We had, now I'm going to be telling you some stories tonight. And of course, I'm going to fictionalize them a little bit to protect the, the real people that this really happened to. But I remember Harmon Digby, who, my man who went, you know, he was an interesting guy. Now, he, he, was, he was a farmer, and he lost his leg, I think, from the knee down, and got caught in a combine or something. You know. So he had, a, he had a wooden leg there. But uh, one Sunday morning, now this is what happened. See, he went to some revival meeting. Now, I'm not against revival meetings, but just hear the whole story now. He went to some revival meeting, and he came back, and he had sewn the, the cuff of his pants to the top of his shoe. And, there, and he didn't have the leg in there. And he was walking along on his crutches, and here's this, you know, this foot just kind of dangling around on, on the end of this, you know, this pant leg. And, uh, you know, well, Harmon, what's going on? He says, I have a leg. You have a leg. I have a leg. The Lord has given me a leg. I'm going to, I have a brand new leg. We there's just an empty pant leg there. There's a shoe flopping around and everything. Oh, but I learned if I believe, and if I just say it, if I say it as if it is already true, it will happen. And he went about a week going around, hey, I have a leg, I have a leg. The Lord has given me a leg. He never got a leg. But it was interesting. There was this whole movement that kind of told people, you know, if you just use the right words, if you just uh, go through the right gestures, if you act the right way, God will give you what you want. I'll give you a flip side of that. In our church, my dad was uh, pastoring, and I was co-pastoring with him, and, and he was in the service there, and he said, well, okay, we're going to pray for sister so-and-so. Uh, you know, she's struggling with cancer, and we're going to just pray to the Lord. And someone stood up in the service and said, oh, Brother Peretti, Oh, God forbid, you said that word. We cannot say the word because we will speak it into existence. There was a whole movement that basically said, if you say something, if you say, oh, I have a cold, you're going to get a cold. If you say, oh, it's kind of tough for me right now, it's going to be tough for you. If you say, well, cancer, oh, you're going to get cancer. It's like the Lord has given creative power to your lips. There was this whole confession movement, positive confession, name it and claim it, blab it and grab it. <laughs> or, 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 or don't say it so you don't get it. <laughs> now, folks, come, you know, I was thinking about what the Bible says about the tongue. The tongue is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Who can tame it? Do you think for one moment God is going to trust that tongue with creative power? <laughs> hey, well, what if you really did get everything that you said? Well, I'll be switched. <laughs> well, I'll be a monkey's uncle. <laughs> Anything else? I mean, you've got to be careful of some of these things, but you know where this comes from. It comes from this whole idea of magic. 
Magic, I want to tell you just quickly what magic really is. Magic is the idea that there is some kind of a, a primordial force out there. Uh, Star Wars, old movie now, old movie, but it still talks about the force. The, the whole idea that there is an impersonal cosmic force out there. Witchcraft is based on that idea. The idea that if you have the right incantation, if you do the right little amulets and, and shake your rattle just right and do the right chant or whatever, you can manipulate the force and get it to do what you want it to do. You become the moral agent. This is kind of a just normal human fallacy that we run into. You, know, you bring it into Christianity and you're basically saying, I can manipulate God by what I say, by what I do. You know, God isn't an impersonal force. He happens to be a loving father, a very wise person. And you're not really the one who's calling the shots in this game. He is. Now, as a little kid, you know, I used to think I could manipulate mom and dad if I say the right things and if I do the right tantrum. If I <laughs> mom and dad are just, you know, mom and dad, they just know everything before you do. And you can't really fool them. You can't really fool God either. God is, are you ready for the word? Sovereign. Well, if magic doesn't work, maybe I can cut a deal. <laughs> you just think I can cut a deal with God. This Barry Snipes went to our church, and uh, he was trying to sell his house. And it wasn't selling. And uh, one morning I, I came to church there, and we had a pretty small church. And up in the front of the church now, yeah, I think they had to move a couple of pews back a little bit, scrunch the pews a little bit. Here's this huge, big, black, grand piano sitting there in the front of the church. And I said, wow, where did that come from? Oh, well, Barry Snipes bought that for the church. Barry Snipes bought that for the church? That's incredible. Well, the truth of the matter was, the story was, Barry wanted to sell his house. And it wasn't selling, so he figured, I know what I'll do. If I give the Lord a grand piano, he'll help me sell my house. There's this idea out there you can bribe God, kind of cajole him, maybe lay a guilt trip on him. I'll give you a piano, you know. What are you, you going to do for me? <laughs> no, it kind of reminds me of the idol worship of the pagan cultures. If you're into a fertility culture, an agricultural culture where everything depends on your crops and the fertility of your soil and the fertility of your women and you got to have lots of babies to do the work and lots of crops so you've got lots of wealth. Well, what do you do? You invent a fertility god or a fertility goddess and then you butter up that god or goddess with gifts. Uh, with Moloch, of course, I'll give you the most extreme example, they would sacrifice their children to Moloch. Why? So that Moloch would give them more kids. Down payment. Right? <laughs> My word, it's not that extreme, and that's pretty, pretty horrible, but it's the same idea. That's why they had gods of war, they had gods of love, they had gods of weather, you know, the rain god, gods who control everything. How do you get rain? You give offerings, you butter up the rain god. We, we had a whole little thing like that going on, another movement uh, called the well, I think uh, it's called lots of things. I remember when I was in L.A., I mean, I'd go to a Bible study and some folks were teaching this uh, seed faith idea. And there was a televangelist back then who had oh, books published and everything and everybody was studying this seed faith. If you want to get God's blessings, you give him something. That's the seed. You seed that, and then this abundant harvest comes back. If you want a brand new stereo system, you give God your old ghetto blaster. <laughs> if, if you want a wonderful new sports car, you give God your old Volkswagen Rabbit. You know, just, just a, a way to prime the pump, a way to get God to give you the things that you wanted. The thing I noticed about that, it didn't take me a long time to figure that out, you know, that didn't do a whole lot for us in terms of uh, discipline or sacrifice or delayed gratification. All we really did was spiritualize greed and self-interest. Often we can take our own desires and our own lusts and we can dress them up really nice in Christian clothing and they become a new doctrine, they become a new idea, they become a new source of revival. 
Well, it turned out Barry could not afford that piano. As a matter of fact, he went deep in the hock to pay for the thing. So now not only could he not sell his house, he couldn't pay for the piano either. He ended up giving it back. I want to tell you something. Barry sold his house. It was not because he gave God a piano. It was because God, as a loving father, in his own timing said, I'm going to take care of my boy. I'm going to take care of him, and he's going to sell that house when I'm good and ready for him to sell it, and when we have the right buyer, I'm going to make sure he gets the right price for it. There's a little verse I love to fall back on, and that is, the blessings of the Lord have no sorrow attached. When you let God control the blessing, when you let God time the blessing, when you let God decide how much the blessing is going to be and how you're going to get it, Guess what? No strings attached. You won't be in debt. There won't be sorrow. There won't be any uh, problems that come with it. You'll be free and clear, and you can have your blessing and keep it. That's the way God really blesses. Well, it takes a while to learn things like that. I had a little lesson I had to learn when I was about, oh, what was it, 18, 19? Oh, I just graduated from high school, and I was so spiritual. He used to go to a Bible study and a prayer meeting and we'd just praise God and we'd just do all the charismatic stuff and we was full of the Spirit and, oh, yes. I had the gift of prophecy and I could prophesy what was going to happen. And I had the gift of healing and I'd lay my hands on people and they would get healed. And I used to just think, I've got God all figured out. Oh, I'm ready for my ministry. I am ready to go. God, use me. You know, the first thing God did was say, you know, there's something you need to face in life. It's called... <coughs> A job. <laughs> I'd never really had a job before. Jobs are weird. I mean, I'd never done, I mean, for me it was, uh, the alarm goes off, and you, you turn off the alarm, and you get up, and you get dressed, and you get in the car, or get a ride, or whatever, and you go to work. Then you work all day long. And you go home and you eat your dinner and you go to bed. And you get up in the morning, uh, and then you get in the car and you go to work. And you work all day and you come home and eat your dinner and you go to bed. And you get up in the morning, uh, and you go to work again. And this is not right. Oh, Lord God, this is not right. I was called to minister to you. I was called to be a prophet and a teacher and a preacher. There's got to be a mistake that happened here. I was working in a shipyard. I was the guy that had to go down inside the, the walls of the boat, and I had to clean off all the welder's beads and brush off all the rust, and, and, and I was down there in the bowels of the ship, and there was an iron ship, you know, and some guy on the outside was welding, and I'd be working, and here'd be this red-hot spot going across the wall right there. And, 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 and then, then after a while, he decided he needed to make sure his weld was good, so he'd bang on the hull of the boat with a sledgehammer. <laughs> well, I was boing, boing, and it was really bad, and I used to... But you know what happened? I want you to know what happened. You know, I was in, I was in love with a girl at the time, too. Yes, I had it all figured out. The Lord visited me in the bowels of that boat. Yay, yay, yay. He spoke King James English. You know. <laughs> Thou shalt not long work in the bowels of this boat, for surely I have called thee to go to Minneapolis and work for Billy Graham. Wow, yeah, I had my little piece of chalk. I used to circle the bad welds with it. I wrote this prophecy on the wall of the ship. I can imagine someone coming through there and seeing that. 
I had this wonderful vision. Of course God doesn't want me at this job. He doesn't want me working in a boat factory. He wants me to get out there and change the world for Christ. And so, and you know how it is when you really, you, you know, you're hearing from God. <laughs> Suddenly everything lines up with it. I mean, you see signs and confirmations in license plates and... Uh, <laughs> Songs on the radio and, uh, and what's on your pizza. You can see it. Oh, this is a sign. This is a sign. I'm supposed to leave at 9, nine after the hour of 4 in the morning because I heard the Beach Boys sing, she's real fine, my 409. I mean, it's all in there. I just knew that if God called me. And so I quit my job and I got on a train and I traveled to Minneapolis and I, I walked in into Billy Graham's office on Hennepin Avenue, and I was wearing ragged clothes from the shipyard. I didn't change or anything. I was wearing a backpack. Now, I would like to say, it'd be nice, wouldn't it? I'd like to say that I came in the front door, and there was Billy Graham, and Cliff Barrows, and George Beverly Shea. They were on their knees in the, in the lobby, praying. And I came in the door, and they looked up. And they said, praise God, you've come. <laughs> We've been in prayer, and the Lord told us that a deliverer would come. Please show us the way. You know, it turned out they didn't really have an opening for an 18-year-old banjo player fresh out of high school with no training or experience. I couldn't figure it out. I spent three nights at the YMCA, and then I went home. But I want to tell you something. Who got blamed? Who got blamed? God, what are you doing? Why did you send me clear to Minneapolis, and then nothing even came of it? I came back home, and you know, uh, I didn't have any visions, and nothing ever happened, and the girl that I was going to marry broke up with me. My dad, I remember him trying to soft pedal this as much as he could uh, when, when I was getting ready to go. Uh, you know, uh, moms and dads, uh, maybe even the Lord feels this way. It's real tough to reason with someone who's been hearing from God. <laughs> he he uh, tried to talk a little sense to me. Well, Frank, why don't you, uh, you know, maybe you should write to them call them or something and ask them if perhaps they're expecting someone like you. I mean, <laughs> he did give me one piece of advice that I did take it. He said, son, that's great. If you're called of God, that's fine. Just make sure you buy a round trip ticket. <laughs> I used it. Yeah, I came home. Maybe that was one of my first death of innocence kind of moments there, you know. All those great prophecies I had, they didn't come true. As for the sick I laid hands on, well, Harry the diabetic, he remained a diabetic, and Laurie still had to wear her glasses, and oh, there's nothing like traveling clear to Minneapolis for absolutely nothing to make you reevaluate your faith and your system of guidance. <laughs> The point that I learned from that, and I'm sharing it with you, is, oh, there's no limit to what God can do, and I'm not belittling any of that, but oh, boy, our God, for most of us, is way too small. We conceive our God as some kind of a guy that we can really figure out. We can really put words in his mouth. We can really manipulate him. We can get him to do what we want him to do. Any God that is that easy and that much of a pushover and doesn't care about you enough to discipline you and say no once in a while is not worthy of your worship. Your God is a father, and he's going to act like one. <laughs> oh, yeah. Let me do it. I call this my Italian overhead. I don't have the, the, uh, you know, the, the words up there. I've got to draw a picture for you. 
talking about guidance, okay? How you know the Lord's guiding you? Well, you know, let's see. Here, first category, I would call this special revelation, all right? Now, special revelation, that's the pretty special thing. God can speak to you kind of through his word, through the witness of the spirit. Uh, if you're into the charismatic or Pentecostal tradition, you can receive a prophecy, uh, lots of things like that. There are these special revelations where you just know God is speaking to you. And I don't belittle that. But okay, that's, the, that's number one. But watch this now. You come over here to number two. And here's number two, which is general revelation. And I would call that, this is the word of God, the written word of God. This is uh, common sense simple wisdom, simple logic, use your head. Frank, why don't you just write to them or call them? I mean, do something. I mean, you, you, you just find out what's really going on. Check this out and what the Bible says and what mom and dad might say. Get some counsel. Do this the mature and practical and reasonable way. Use your head. That's number two. Number three, is fantasy. We're back to Peter Pan and Superman and fairy dust and formulas. This is the thing that says, oh, I just know God wants me to marry him. No, he doesn't have a job. No, he doesn't know the Lord. No, his car doors won't stay shut. But I just know the Lord wants me to marry him and I'm going to save him after we're married. I just know God wants me to go to Minneapolis. I just know that. You know what it usually boils down to? It's not what you just know God wants. It's what you want. You get some hankering, you're, you're hot on some idea, and boy, you're living in fantasy land, and suddenly, miraculously, everything seems to line up. <laughs> you see a, 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 a sign beside the road, and it just kind of confirms to you this is what you're supposed to do. You're just so gaga about some guy you want to marry, if you're a girl, and some girl you want to marry, if you're a guy. And, well, nowadays it could go the other way, too. <laughs> yeah. And people can find a way. They will find a way. Now, here's what happens. People will walk in number three, in fantasy, they will insist up one side and down the other that it's number one special revelation from God so that they do not have to deal with number two, which is common sense and wisdom. We get so much into our own hankerings. We put words in God's mouth. We put will into God's mind. We hear what we want to hear from God, and we say, oh, it's a special revelation. And mom and dad or anybody else is saying, why don't you think about this? Oh, no, I've heard from God. Well, you learn to get over that when it doesn't work for a while. There's one thing about walking with the Lord and one thing about faith. A lot of things are attributed to faith. I have faith. I just want to say one thing I've learned. Faith does not give you permission to be a jerk. <laughs> there was a young man lived on, I used to live on uh, Vashon Island, which is just off uh, uh, Seattle. It's out in Puget Sound, surrounded by water. Anyway, there was a young man, about 18 years old. He renamed himself Moses Joseph. This guy was really into number three. I am Moses Joseph. I am called to serve the Lord. And we didn't know what in the world to do with him. He was a little bit of an embarrassment. You know, he'd walk through town prophesying. He had a hood over his head. He had a staff in his head. He was really tripping out. He went down to the shore and he felt called to preach and prophesy in Seattle. And he could have walked to the edge of the beach and tried it first. Then he only would have gotten his feet wet. But he knew he was going to walk on water. 
And he went and walked off the end of the pier. <laughs> Fortunately, he knew how to swim. <laughs> he didn't get to Seattle that day. I remember the pastor's wife saying, oh, do you know what Moses Joseph did today? And I said, what? He walked off the end of a pier. I don't know what we're going to do with that young man. I said, that's great. That is great. That's great news. He walked off the pier and got all wet. Maybe that, that might be what he needed. Just get wet for a change. Then maybe that'll wake him up a little bit, especially when the water's so cold. <laughs> oh, had another friend who went to one of those woo kind of churches. Um, now, there are nice woo kind of churches, but then there are the, the churches that are really into the woo and they're not too much into the, what does the Bible say? It's just one of those kind of things. There's a gal had diabetes, of course. They were claiming her, her healing, and they were praying for her healing and everything, and, and uh, she went off of her insulin, and they were still praying for her, and she came very close to dying, and they called in the paramedics to, to revive her and so forth, and the parents got her out of that church because it was just going to kill her, and then my friend... Uh, and his wife came to me and they said, do you know any good lawyers or anything? And I said, what for? We want to get legal counsel because we're going to kidnap her so that she can come back and complete her healing, get her away from her parents and away from all this doctor stuff, and we're going to claim the healing in Jesus Christ. That sounds so holy, doesn't it? It sounds so full of faith. I'll tell you what that is. That's stupidity. That is stupidity. That's real zone three. I figure if God's going to heal you, bring the doctors in and let them watch. <laughs> Why run from the doctors if God's going to heal them? Let's do the miracle and let's have it documented. Let's do it right. But don't try to force God's hand. Don't try to force it. I have a very important message to give to you. Having built all this little foundation for you, you know what I've found out over, what, 30 plus years since I knew it all? God doesn't really work in your life through the big cosmic spiritual flashes, through the high points. The spiritual walk of faith is not a series of spiritual explosions it is a long, slow burn. Like Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, 12 through 13, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God works in your life step by step. And you know what? You've all probably found this out about God. Boy, he can take his time. <laughs> he can take his time. I, uh, I, I've met many people who live from explosion to explosion, <laughs> from high to high. Uh, they're, they're kind of in this spiritual walk. They love being in zone three because zone three just feels so good. And, and they're, oh, I'm struggling in my walk. Oh, but there's a revival coming to town. I love it how people can schedule revivals, you know. Next week, Monday through Friday, God is going to move. So they go, this guy comes into town or whatever it is, some big wahoo meeting, you know. And, and they get themselves all, whoa! They go to this meeting, vroom, 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 and they get all pumped up spiritually. Vroom, vroom. Oh, and God is powerful. Vroom. He's on the throne. Vroom. Hallelujah. Vroom. I've got the power. Vroom. And they come back from this wonderful revival meeting, and they've had a mountaintop experience. Oh, and they're full of the Holy Ghost. They just touch the light bulb, and it comes on. You know, that's just, they're just really going. And then they come back, and they have to face the real world, and the dog is pooped on the rug, and the kids need to be, be, be dressed, and and the husband is not happy with his job and the bills have come in the mail and other things are demanding their time and they have to start cleaning the house and they have to start working at their job and they have to start facing life the really way where it really is and by the time they get about to Thursday their life has slowed down to where <laughs> Ha! 
I got to go back. I go, oh, so they go back to the revival meeting again. I go, I'm I'm spiritual moment getting prayed for. Wow, they fall down under the power. They do all that cool stuff. And they're all set. And they're, and they're running through life. And they are just in the victory. And then they start facing real life again. And then they get, we used to call it the upsy downsies. The upsy downsies were people would try to live from high too high. They would try to live from spiritual thrill to spiritual thrill. Are you ready for the great wisdom? Let me tell you the great wisdom. Do you know the greatest work God will ever do in your life is not from those high points. It's from those times of waiting in between. It's those times of suffering, of trial, of having to have faith, and your faith is being tested. Moses went up on Mount Sinai and received the Ten Commandments of God. He came back, and they were worshiping a golden calf. <laughs> Jesus was baptized in the Jordan, and the Holy Spirit descended, you know, descended upon him, and the voice from heaven said, My beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And then he went into the wilderness. David was anointed king of Israel by Samuel the prophet. Oh boy, he's ready to be king. Oh no. Soon after that, Saul began to pursue him and he fled for his life for how many years? The Bible is filled with examples of godly men and women who had to go through the furnace. They had to wait. They had to develop godly character. They had to learn to trust the Lord God in between those high points. It's fascinating. Oh, whatever happened to me? Well, I got back from Minneapolis. Nothing ever happened there. I had to work at a job. <laughs> As time went by, I tried a lot of different things. I had my, my successes and my joys and things, but just to condense things over the long haul, you know. I tried a music career, and that failed. <laughs> I tried to get going in film, went to UCLA and everything. That kind of failed. I tried pastoring a church with my dad for five years. That drove me right into the ground. <laughs> if you're a pastor, God bless you. That wasn't my calling. Well, we got that one solved. I knew I wasn't cut out to be a pastor. I tried developing material for Christian radio, and I failed at that. It's kind of interesting. After all of this, I'd washed out in the ministry. Uh, I'd failed at everything. And you'll never guess where I ended up. I was back in a factory. <laughs> it's kind of like my father, my heavenly dad, was saying, Son, you owe me some factory work here. Remember several years ago when you ducked out and didn't face responsibility and you ran from the dealings and the, and the development and the character I was trying to build in you? <laughs> well, we're going to take care of that now. <laughs> I worked in the K2 ski factory making skis for three years. This is where God forges character. I uh, would just like to say, where are we? Okay. I want to share with you real quick. It's not in my notes, but I just want to share this with you. I call it the Jacob moment. The Jacob moment. And this is a whole other message I do, but I'm going to give you as quick a little as I can. You remember the story of Jacob, how he fooled his brother into, you know, and he bought his brother's birthright with a bowl of red soup. Later on, he basically stole his brother Esau's uh, blessing by masquerading as Esau with the goat skins and all Esau and all this. He fled because Esau was going to kill him. You know the story. Went and lived in a foreign land with his uh, uncle, Laban. And he married his wives, Rachel and Leah. And anyway, on his way back, he finally decided he was going to come back to his home country. And he had one little thing that was a, a problem, and that is, you know, my brother Esau is still out there somewhere, <laughs> and he might want to kill me. <laughs> so he sent some uh, messengers ahead to see if Esau was there, and they came back, Jacob, 
we got good news and we got bad news. What's the good news? Your brother Esau is coming to see you. What's the bad news? He's got 300 guys with him. <laughs> and Jacob, oh, you know, he said every brave man that he was, he sent on everybody else ahead. And he, <laughs> and he stayed on the other side of the river. And that night, of course, he was praying. And he said, oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And of course, the Lord sent his holy angel along as a messenger. And it's kind of interesting. That it's just the picture you get. Here's this angel walking by. And boom! Jacob grabs the angel. You know, it's kind of interesting. When Jacob was born, he had hold of his brother Esau's foot. His heel. That's why they called him heel grabber. That's kind of what Jacob means, usurper. And he's been doing that all his life. He's been playing games with God all his life. He's been having his own way all his life. He's been figuring out clever ways to get what he wants all his life. And when he stole his brother Esau's blessing, he lied about who he was. His father said, who are you? And he said, I'm Esau. Now he's grabbing a hold of that angel. He's grabbing a hold of that representation of God. And the angel is saying, let me go. I got to go. No, no, I'm not going to let you go. Do you bless me? No, let me go. I'm not going to let you go. Do you bless me? And the Bible says, of course, that the angel touched the hollow of his thigh. Whoa, <laughs> what you do that for? <laughs> and I can imagine the Lord God saying to him, so you won't run again. you got to bless me. And pay attention now to what the Lord said to Jacob. What is your name? You know what God was asking him? Jacob, are you ready to be honest with me? Are you ready to be who you really are? Is the masquerade over? Are you ready to really and truly do business with God on God's terms as you are? I'm a... I'm Jacob. I'm the heel grabber. I'm the deceiver. I'm he who fled from responsibility, who fled from the truth. I fled from my brother. I've rooked and I've cheated and I've been rooked and cheated and I've manipulated and I've fled from you and I've tried to have things my own way. I am Jacob. And I can imagine the Lord saying, Whew, that took long enough. What does the Lord say? Okay, we'll change your name now. We'll call you Israel, Prince of God, because you have wrestled with God and you've prevailed. Every one of us will have our Jacob moment, I hope. That moment when you're at your wit's end that moment when you've been living in some little illusion of your own making for who knows how long, and you finally get to that point where you're at the end of your rope, you have nowhere else to turn, you are wrestling with God, and God says to you, what is your name? Who are you? I do not want to hear the same old baloney I've been hearing all your life. I don't want you to be putting words in my mouth. I don't want you to be second-guessing my will. I don't want you to be living over here in fantasy land thinking I'm going to do anything you want as soon as you snap your fingers. I want you to come to me in humility and in brokenness and deliver yourself into my hands and into my will and trust me as your father. Can you do that? I had three Jacob moments in my life that I remember. I'm condensing this. The first one was in Minneapolis. 
after everything had fallen through, and I was, I remember I was sitting at a Youth for Christ rally on a Saturday night, and I was all dirty and smelly, and everything had fallen through, and all those nice squeaky clean Youth for Christ kids were up there singing, and we were having this meeting, and, and there was a big altar call, and all the kids were going forward to get saved and all that stuff, and I saw all this wonderful revival and wonderful works of God going on, and I wasn't a part of any of it. God wasn't using me that night. But I remember saying, Lord, I give myself to you. I don't understand what you're doing, but I, I give myself to you. If you want me to be a bum, a vagabond, a dirty unemployed banjo player, <laughs> that's what I'll be, but Lord, I'm yours. And I wrestled with God that night, and I think I came away with just a little bit of, we, we, we did some business. The second one was at UCLA after I'd been down there studying film, and things just weren't working out, and I hated the whole culture down there, and, and I didn't think I was going to get into the film school, and, and everything was just so negative, and I just couldn't connect anywhere, and I just thought it was so homesick, and I just wanted to go home, and... And, and dear Barb, my dear wife, was sticking by me and doing the best that she could, just working to support us. And I, was, and I remember being up in the research library and on the campus of UCLA, and I was sitting in one of the little desks uh, up there in the, in the stacks, and they had all these little study desks. And I remember sitting at that desk and looking out the window, and I remember just weeping before the Lord God. And I was just saying the same old thing, Lord, I don't understand. I don't understand why nothing's working out. I've tried to serve you. I've tried to make the right decisions. I've tried to, and nothing's happening. I, I just said, Lord, all that really matters to me is that I'm doing what you want me to do, and I'll be what you want me to be. And I don't understand, but I trust you. You can have my life, whatever it is. So I did a little more business with God. Did big miracles happen? Was there an earthquake? Was I freed from the Philippian jail? No. I was still at UCLA, very tired and very discouraged, but trusting. The third one, I was back at the factory <laughs> making skis. And you know how you just start whining? I was whining. I was wearing these stupid safety glasses that made me look like a geek. I had my dirty apron on, and I had fiberglass all over me, and I was working, I was painting skis. Now, it's an interesting job. It's full of challenge. You put the ski in the rack, and you take a little uh, bottle, and you apply paint to one side. You wipe off the excess. You turn the ski over, kaboom. You paint the other side of the ski. You wipe off the excess, kaboom. You put the ski in the rack. And you multiply that by about 800 times, and that's what you do all day long. I'm not getting anywhere. I'm not, I, I got so many things I want to do, and I never get to do anything, and I'm 30 years old, and, and I'm a failure, and, and I wanted to be in the ministry, and I washed out of that, and I wanted to be in film, and I washed out of that, and I'm writing these books, and no one wants them. <laughs> now, that was... How can I capture this for you? It was the Lord came alongside me there in the factory. And it was almost, I remember the first thing he did was, I could hear him saying, in, in, this is all in retrospect now, but I know what he was asking. He was saying, what's your name? What's your name? Who are you really, Frank? What's the game here? And I remember this brokenness coming over me, and I began to weep. And I was not weeping because I was feeling sorry for myself. The other two times I was weeping because I was feeling sorry for myself. This time I was weeping because I said, Lord, I am Jacob. I want, I want, I want. 
I've got what I want for my life, and I have my desires, and I have things I wish would work out for me. I want a house, and I want a ministry, and I want to get a publisher, and I want to get out of this factory. I sound like my cat. I want, I want. And I remember weeping. This is, it was really good. The Lord timed this perfectly because I was all by myself in the little corner of the factory just painting skis. So I could cry all I wanted. So I did. And it's almost like the Lord said, okay, okay. Frank, you've hung in, hung in there with me for all these years. I'll tell you what. Now, this is the only time in my life this has ever happened. And I don't, I don't know, maybe the Lord knows, maybe someday I'll need to have it happen again. But right now I kind of feel like, no, I, I probably don't need this to happen again. And only God knows, of course. But it's like the Lord said, okay, Frank, you've called on me and you've called on me. And you've always come away just trusting, but you've never really had an answer. Today I'll give you an answer. And it's impossible to describe, but it was like, just for a moment, he pulled the curtain back, and he showed me the plan he had. It's like that scripture in Jeremiah 29, I know the plans I have for you, for good and not for evil, to bless you and so forth. I, I can't remember the whole thing right now, but that's what it's like. And he just showed me in just an instant Frank, I do have plans for you. I am going to use you. People will talk about your stories. Your stories will touch lives, and they will be in homes all over the country, all over the world. Your characters will be known. I mean, it was about that quick. Just, uh, if I try to embellish it anymore, I, you know, I, I'm just trying to paint it for you. But that was about it. And I felt such an overwhelming presence of God. It's kind of like the Lord said, okay, that's good. Now I got you where I want you. It was a few more years, and you know the story. This present darkness finally got published. It languished on the shelves for about a year. Didn't do much. About the last year that I was in the ski factory, I called every month on my lunch hour. I'd call the publisher to see how the sales were. <laughs> hey, we did 80 copies this month. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> That'll get me out of the factory for sure. I think it was the beginning of about 88. Maybe it's 87. Hey, Frank, you won't believe it. We sold 4,000 copies this month. Wow. 4,000 copies. And the next month, we sold about 20,000 copies. And the next month, we sold about 80,000 copies. Well, it wasn't too long after that. I opened the door of the factory, and I walked out, and I went home and sat down at my computer, and I became a full-time writer. And that was 18 years ago. The Lord works through the waiting. The Lord works by challenging you and stretching you and constantly waiting for you to say, I am Jacob. We live in fantasy land sometimes. Sometimes we think we can make God do what we want him to do. God just keeps plugging away. It was fascinating to me that Paul the Apostle, toward the end of his life, this man had been through shipwreck, he'd been tortured, he'd been beaten, he'd gone through starvation, being stoned. He, he'd been through everything, and it's so fascinating to me that this guy, at the end of his life, in prison, had peace in his heart. Why? Because he had come to know and trust God. 
He's in prison. He's about to die. And he says, I am not ashamed. For I know him. I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced that he is able to keep what I have committed to him against that day. God will take care of me. I've been rich, I've been poor, I've been imprisoned, I've been delivered. I've been stoned, beaten, shipwrecked, God saw me through it all. I sang praises in Philippi, and God sent an earthquake, and we were freed. But I'm in prison now, and there's no earthquake. Nevertheless, I trust him. I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. But I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but to all those who love his appearing. This was a man who walked with God, who grew through the waiting, who learned how to say, I am Saul. I persecuted the church. I blasphemed. I was a tormentor. I was a liar. But Lord God, I trust you through the beatings, through the wait, through the struggle, because you are the Lord God who holds me in your hand. And even in death, I trust you. There, ladies and gentlemen, is the wealthiest man in the world. He has achieved what we need to achieve. He has achieved God's very best for him. So, here we are back to the present, and I'm sitting across the table from this young college girl, and she's saying, I want everything God has for me. And I'm looking at those bright eyes and that youthful grin. And I kind of think about how that's where I was 30 years ago, just starting to take that step into the grand adventure. And I'm wondering, what in the world am I going to say to her? What do you say to her? God speed, young lady. <laughs> God speed. Oh, some of it's going to be glorious. Some of it's going to be tough. Some of the things you're going to understand, and for some things, there just are no explanations. But you got to remember this, God loves you. He's working in your life. He will not drop you. He will give you what you need, even when you don't want it. <laughs> He'll be faithful. He'll never drop you because that's the way he is. Press on. You will make it. Guaranteed. Can I pray with you? Let's pray. Lord God, I pray for each and every life right here, right now. Every life is on that voyage right now. There are some here who are in a season of doubt, a season of turmoil, a season of hunger, wondering, where is God? When am I going to get an answer? Lord God, I pray that you would minister to them and remind them and assure them and encourage them you have not dropped them. You have a plan for their life, and you will carry it out. I pray, Lord, for all the Jacobs in the group. I pray that you would bring them to that point where they are willing to say, once and for all, I am Jacob. No more games. No more wishful thinking. No more manipulating. May they come to you in humility and in brokenness and embrace your will for their life. I pray for the young Lord, that you would guide them and embrace them, and may they place their trust in you starting now, and may they walk with you all the years of their life. 
I pray for the older ones who have been running from you all these years, trying to define for you what you wish for them. Break them, Lord. Break them. Bring them to that point of struggle where you can ask them, what is your name? And they can say, I am fill in the blank. Thank you, Lord, for being the loving Father that we need. Thank you for being the one that won't let us off easy, but you will perfect each one of us as your children until we attain <laughs> to that victory, even if it's in death. That with Paul we can say, I know whom I have believed. Praise your name, Lord. Give us safety on the way home. Thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. God speak. God speak. This has been A Few Things I Learned Since I Knew It All, presented by Frank Peretti. If you'd like to purchase this presentation on audio, video, or DVD-R, or receive a free tape catalog of over 100 top Bible teaching videos on dozens of subjects, call Compass, 800 977 2177 or on the web at compass.org.